Hey, Sarah, welcome to Keep What You Earn. It's so great to have you. Yeah, great to talk with you. I always love the opportunity to spend time with you. You're such a fun person. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I take that as a high compliment for an accountant. So that's really cool. (laughs) Yes, for sure. (laughs) So um, tell us a little bit about how you became passionate about operations and the stuff that quite frankly, you and I, I think relate to one another because we both love the stuff that people normally think is boring in a business. Uh, so tell us about how you kind of became passionate around business operations and a little bit of your background. Yeah, great question. You know, I was working at a company long ago. I won't say the year to date. I don't want to date myself, but one of the things that we were really looking at is this company had rapid growth and they had moved and had a ton of employees. And unfortunately the operations and tech side didn't grow with the staff. There was a ton of people working there. However, they were still doing things with what I would say duct tape and band-aids. So people were not efficient. They were sitting, downloading data from one Excel spreadsheet, importing it into another, and it just wasn't very efficient. And so my supervisor was like, go figure out what's not working. And I sat with people and it's one of my favorite things to do is to sit with somebody and watch them work. And then I would ask them questions like, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And a lot of times it came down to, they didn't have the tools or they just didn't know a better way. And they were spending hours doing things that a programmer could program in like 10 minutes and automate. And so that's really where my passion started because I was able to go through the whole company. I sat in departments that I knew nothing about, like financial aid. We were a a school. And so I said in financial aid, I didn't know anything about financial aid, but what really came from asking those questions of why do you do this? And me not having that background, we were able to change and revolutionize the way that they were able to do business. We were able to make them more efficient. And the best part about it was we were able to reduce the hours that people were working. The overtime went down, the turnover went down, and we made more money. So that's where it all started. And I've been on that kick ever since. It's such a great feeling when you can help someone like that. And I love that you tied it back to really the biggest impact is the least hours worked and therefore quality of life and all the things that go along with that. So for those listening who are thinking, cause I know I'm one of them too, going, I want that <laughs> because yeah. I feel like even when, even if you have the best intentions for your processes, when you're starting a new business or you've been in business and you just have you know, your way of doing things or don't have someone there to tell you or, or be that person over your shoulder, you're doing a lot as an entrepreneur. What are some of the ways from what you've seen that entrepreneurs are probably creating inefficiencies for themselves and maybe don't even know it? Yeah, that's a great question. And many times new entrepreneurs can't afford the fancy bells and whistles. And so I think it's really important to think about what is the quickest way to go from A to Z And even if you're not operational, many times people are visual or creative, really map that out and think about every step in your, in your business. And so some of the things that I see that people do that are inefficient, um, for example, a lot of entrepreneurs have a podcast and they will say, well, I spend hours and hours and hours a week putting out a podcast. And so I think there are some efficiencies that you can create in there by collecting the information you need up front, pushing people to, if you are looking for sponsors for your podcast, pushing them right to there and making it as easy as checking out on a product, but really creating those folders in your, in your, um, in your folders, so in your uh, documents, so that you're able to collect all the information and you're only touching it once. And that is the key when you're trying to streamline your operations. We're going to have to do work. We're going to have to dig, dig, dig into a spreadsheet or dig into the files or check email, unfortunately. But if you can only handle it one time, That will streamline everything. And then when you get to the point where you can hire somebody, 
you already have an efficient system that they can easily jump into and just take over rather than saying, I don't understand how we got from A to Z. Totally. So yeah. how do you recommend that entrepreneurs start taking a good, hard look at their operations to start, you know, streamlining this a bit more? Yeah, I like to do what's called a productivity audit. And that really starts with, if you're working with someone, someone, what I would do is watch you work. But if you're going to do it by yourself, what I would do is on a day that you have some stuff where it's more tasky, less meetings, to take a look at every single thing you're doing from morning to night, and then how you're doing it. And really thinking about how many times am I touching one thing? How many times am I jumping from task to task? Am I moving from working on my podcast to creating content for social media, to filming reels, to all those things? And that audit will really bring to light what your time sucks are. And then if you outline the process, like from A to Z, start to finish, and who's all involved, as well as which systems you have to get into. Because when we start to system jump from email to Excel <laughs> to our podcast, podcast host or whatever, that's where things kind of get hung up or if we're waiting on somebody else. So that yeah. audit really is like the flashlight that will kind of identify things that will stick out as not efficient. And then you can take one thing at a time. Because what happens in a productivity audit, a lot of times people get overwhelmed. They're like, oh my gosh, the, all my systems aren't efficient. <laughs> and where do I start? Start with one thing. And once you get that one thing streamlined, it'll help you relieve some time, relieve some pressure, and then you can move to the next. Exactly. And I think that a lot of what's holding most folks back right now is the idea that I have to fix everything then they have analysis paralysis and they fix nothing because it's so overwhelming. Yeah. So what would you recommend uh, entrepreneurs focus on first in terms of their priority? Is it where they think they're the most inefficient? Is it where they, you know, is it a certain part of their process or their customer journey that you think is most important? What would you focus on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would always start with where the customer comes into the journey because Many times that is through email or social media, and that is where there tends to be a break in the, in the flow because they're waiting on you to respond to an email or you get, you get a conversation going on social media and then you have to go to something else and then you have to pick up where you're, where you left off. So really thinking about what's the quickest way to take my customer from my, from their interest, because that is when they're hot. They're, they're trying to fix their problem. They're trying to buy your service. They saw you on social media and got excited. However that interest started, they're hot. So the quickest that you can get them into your pipeline, working with you, the better, because then they start to cool down or they run into somebody else who does the same thing that gets them into their pipeline quicker. So that's always where I start. How do I get my customer working with me right away? or taking the next action, whatever that is, like downloading the freebie or, you know, connecting with me in a different way, liking me on social media, and then moving to having a conversation. And it's also setting a first impression about what it's like to work with you. So it's really a big chance to make or break. And not only can it, can these inefficiencies be inconvenient for you and missing out on opportunities, but it actually can create a negative brand for you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have something in place or people don't have a good experience interacting with you in that first impression. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it's okay to be honest with people. If you don't work all the time, you know, one of right. the things we did at that first company I worked at, we basically told our customers, we value our team and they, unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, and they will not work past five o'clock. So if you have what you call an emergency, we set up a team that dealt with emergencies. Mm. And I think it's okay to be very transparent. You know, I see a lot of entrepreneurs who put in their auto responders, you know, if you've reached me on a Saturday or Sunday, I'm probably at the pool or whatever, enjoying me time and making sure I'm fresh for the week. I think that's okay. 
And I think you need to be honest with people, but it's that instant communication that tells them and, and alerts them when they can expect to hear from you. Yeah. I think that we don't take enough responsibility for our Mm -hmm. own expectation setting when it comes to that stuff. And I actually think a lot of the productivity issues that we experience, what I would diagnose to myself as productivity issues are actually boundaries and expectation setting issues. Mm -hmm. And it turns into productivity because there are no walls around the work hours or what yeah. has to get done in those work hours. And therefore we get more lax with, well, I'll get that done tonight, you know, or uh, work will bleed over. But instead of, instead of uh, condensing the work to fit into that boundary, mm-hmm. we just kind of let it run wild. Well, and also you set a precedent, like if you're in, you're in a, especially uh, time pressing industry where people do tend to put it off, you know, that they'll wait till the last minute because unfortunately not everybody is as excited about money and numbers. And so if you every year get their stuff on April 14th or, you know, you're you're always going to be in a time crunch. And so it's really setting yourself up for you having stress and then also for error, you know, the, when you do things close to a deadline, when you're tired and you're not fresh, there's errors. And then also the customer might not have the best experience because they might not get the best you. Mm -hmm. And this tax season, we implemented something similar. So we actually drew a hard line and said, if we don't have your stuff by X date, you're going Mm -hmm. to get extended and we will get it done in the order that we get your stuff in. And it was actually so freeing because it, it, Said, I said, okay, as of this date, what we have is what we have, (laughs) you know, we're closing the door. You can wait on the wait list now. And everyone who's in, it's kind of like those Disney rides where I'm like, okay, you wait for the next ride. Everyone who's in here, we have a full auditorium. We will get through, we will get through this airing of the show and then we will let you in. And having that flow really did give me some more peace of mind of, wait a minute, I can set the expectation. I can close the door and say, Mm -hmm. you must wait until the next round starts. And what it actually did was it did two things. One was it motivated people to either, if they had a high priority to get it done or felt like they wanted to sneak into that first group, Mm -hmm. then I gave you, here's what it will take to do that. We need your stuff by this date. And if they don't do it, then they're not surprised at all if we're going to be extending. So I think that that is something you can apply to any type of business, not just mine with tax returns, but if you need something from clients, you can set deadlines. And actually Mm -hmm. I find when you set deadlines for your clients and therefore create dependencies in your operations, it really does teach you a lot about the client and their level of priority for the work that you're doing, because it can affect the relationship if deadlines aren't being met and they're not responding to you, right? Yeah. And I think one of the things as well is that the client really decides at that point. So that guilt as a business owner, you can relieve some of that guilt, but the client then takes on that guilt. You know, when a deadline's coming up and you feel guilty, you haven't done anything about it, or you haven't studied for that test. It's that same feeling. So they Mm -hmm. get that, but then they have the opportunity to make a decision how important that deadline is to get into the first wave is, or if they're like, well, I I'm not that motivated to get it done and I'm going to do the extension thing. So it relieves a lot of pressure on, on you, but it also allows that client to, to own that uh, sense of urgency. Right. They have the responsibility. We're not trying to shift guilt over to people. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, but it's the ownership and responsibility and control that we put back in their hands to say, you're in control of when this gets done now. And I love that feeling because it does tell me where they're at, because maybe for me, I'm definitely a, I mean, I don't know if you do human design stuff. I'm a manifesting generator and an Enneagram Mm -hmm. three who is like, I just want to get everyone's stuff done as fast as possible. Of course, correctly, but I want to just get it all done because I I am hooked on the feeling of it's done. And the thing is that other, my clients are not like that. My clients are like, I'll get it to you when I get it to you. And that gets in the way of me getting it done. But in the reality, it's like, but you're in the business of client service, Shannon, you're not in the business of churning out tax returns. You don't work for the man anymore. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's on them too. If, they, mm-hmm. if that's not a priority, then that's okay. And they're right. still happy because <laughs> if exactly. it's a priority, they'll get it done. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about how, you know, what other areas I know there's, you know, client service where we can be more efficient. You mentioned, you know, the client intake process, so to speak, like the, you know, the awareness and interaction. Let's talk about, you know, let's kind of go through a few examples maybe of ways that you can hack your productivity as a business owner, starting with the, I call it the pre-client phase, right? The whole prospect phase from the marketing all the way through sales, right? So where can, where are entrepreneurs just essentially wasting time when it comes to their sales process? Yeah, I, I honestly think that starts with social media Mm. and we all know, you know, that's like one of those things. Once you pick up the phone, you're on it for hours, you're scrolling and scrolling and creating social. So I think the first way that a lot of, a lot of, um, entrepreneurs get customers is through social or sending emails to their list. And it's really that content creation process. And in order to streamline that, it, it unfortunately comes down to time blocking and spending a, a bigger chunk of time on it rather than small little chunks. And when you spend a, a block of time, maybe at the beginning of the month for the, ne- for the next month, really thinking through that strategy and then building the content around it and either scheduling it out or having it ready to go, that's the quickest way to streamline. Because when you're bringing in clients, when you're spending so much time creating that content on a daily basis, your, your, your mind is working on different things, especially if you're in a a very detailed or technical field, it's two different sides of your brain. And so you're kind of focus shifting. So if you can really streamline that content pre-client it becomes more purposeful as well. And then you can always sprinkle in, you know, if something comes out and it's like trending and you didn't start the trend, you can sprinkle that in as well on top of what you've already planned. But that content strategy and really spending time on that early will help ensure that the message is correct and that you're driving people to what you're currently focusing on in a way that's meaningful. I love that. And another thing that comes to mind that I've struggled with, I'll be completely transparent. I've really struggled with the, um, the intake process and qualification of leads. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when I first started my business, everyone who was anyone who went to my website, got a 30 minute booking link to schedule a consult. Yeah. And what I learned pretty quickly (laughs) is that not everyone should get a 30 minute booking link to schedule a consult. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that they're not qualified to work with me. It just means that there are a lot of things that I need to know to know how to make the use out of that 30 minutes, or if we really need to have a phone call. And mm-hmm. if it's really better served for everyone's time, because time is a limited resource, yeah. if it's really better served to turn that into an email or send a voice note or whatever that may look like, it doesn't have to be a formal call, yeah. you know, I know others are struggling with this. What advice do you have on how to... Uh, how to improve that process for folks listening. Yeah, the I, I call it the endless coffee dates. <laughs> yes. Now everybody, let's have coffee. And what's funny is I don't even drink coffee. So I always felt bad, especially in person when we really were going to get coffee. Huh. And I'm like, oh, I need to make sure that place has something other than coffee. Anyway, it's it's really difficult because everybody wants to connect and, you know, business is relational. People want to get to know you and to feel your personality out before they work with you. And I think what's really important is figuring out a way that you can streamline who's ready to work with you and who's not. And one of the ways to do that is to first make sure your messaging is correct so that they know they can self-identify that like, oh, I'm not ready. And some ways to do that are if you're a business owner who's making X, Y, Z or looking to do X, Y, Z, then sounds like we should have a call. And then you put into, if you have a calendarly booking or whatever system you're using, you put in some questions to self-identify that out. 
if you're fortunate enough to have a team or have the ability to outsource or have a done for you service, you can easily sort who's taking that calendar appointment. And so the client is saying, or the, the, the person is saying that they think that they are ready to have that meeting with you. And you may or may not think that based on their response. And I like to sort those out. You know, when you think about a, a company, you never get to talk to the CEO on your first phone call. And so if we're in the business of building businesses, we, we really need to act like a business. And there's can be some steps. And I love when the business owner is the cheerleader on top. You know, they're the ones who come in and say, you know, I'm so excited to work with you. My team had such great things to say about you on that initial call. And now let's jump in. So you can kind of be the one who gets more in depth, but that qualification process of having those short phone calls, first qualify them before they even get into the phone call. If you do have other people who can take the calls, I highly suggest it. Either find a VA or outsource that or do like a done for you service where somebody will do that for you. And then once they get to the point where they really are ready to work with you and actually spend the money to work with you, then bump them up to you to have that higher level of questioning as far as what they're looking for and where you can really showcase your service. That's what I like to do. I think sometimes it's hard when you first start, but having endless coffees with people that go nowhere, just suck up your time. And unfortunately, then you're not making money. Yeah. And, and we're not getting paid by friendships, even though networking is very important, mm -hmm. you know, building those relationships is great, but you always have to be mindful of how much time you're spending on yeah. something that may not turn into a fruitful business opportunity. And yeah. I, I love what you said about doing a done for you service or outsourcing this. Now here's what everyone is thinking. Well, I'm really good at deciding who's a good fit. I have to get involved in that process. I need to be I need mm -hmm. to be the deciding factor. What if they don't understand my business mm -hmm. or I'm sure there's a ton of excuses yeah. and reasons that folks are hesitant to outsource this. What would you say um, to that objection to outsourcing? Yeah. So I think there's two real things going on with a lot of entrepreneurs. A lot of entrepreneurs love to sell and they're really good at it. And then there's other entrepreneurs that can do it because they know they need to do it, but they really want to do what they started their business for. So I think it's really important to get clear on what type of entrepreneur you, you want to be. And if you love to sell, then you're going to have to outsource the people to do the work. <laughs> if you are like, I want to do my business, then I think what you really need to do is think about when you are working with someone and they can gather the information, then you can come in and tell them all the details. And I think what's really important when you're developing that relationship with a done for you service or an outsource, however you decide to do, to do that, you need to tell them all the things about your business that you're passionate about. They need to feel it. They need to understand it and they need to own it. And they can get just as excited about your product as you can, because they understand what you do and what makes you so special. And then they can really edify you. They can talk about how awesome you are, the other customers that have worked with you. And then when you come in, you already, the stage is already set. So I think it's really important that you find people that share your passion but they don't need to know how you do what you do. They don't need to know all the ins and outs, like for, for example, of how to do taxes. They just right. need to know why you're the special one they should work with. Exactly. And I think that folks uh, overestimate what they have to, you know, what they have to analyze when it comes to, I think it really can be quantified and measured pretty easily in terms of metrics, right? So if someone, yeah. let's say you have an intake form, I, and tell me what you think about this. Yeah. I have a lot of intake form questions that are binary choices or are numbers or are, you know, multiple choice, fixed choice, very little um, open-ended text. Yeah. Because what I was planning on doing is then giving a guideline book to whoever does this, right? Whoever does lead intake and say, here are the right answers or here are the desired answers in order of 
what we want. And if, I mean, if I could, I would score it like a Cosmo quiz, Yeah, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but I wanted to keep it as fixed as possible to then categorize and be able to offer guidance because the more open-ended and vague someone's responses to a question, the more that your person who's doing this has to apply judgment and then has to go abstract. And I, I like to keep it relatively fixed. I mean, do you think that's a good habit or do you think it's really good to provide as much detail as possible? Yeah, I think it depends on what you're doing. Right. And who you're talking to for your type of business. I love that because that really narrows down who you want to work with, who's going to be the right fit and who's not. And that will help somebody who's on the phone and then they can provide the personality and the, you know, the, the fluffiness on the intro call and why you're awesome. And then they can really say, Hey, you guys would be a great fit because you answered these questions the way that, you know, need to be answered. So I think it's a great way to do it. I would probably say if as a client, you need to remember that everybody has different, you know, some people are creative and not numbers driven and they're, or some people love numbers. I love numbers. So to me, that'd be awesome. So I think just being mindful of if it's client facing, is it really picking up on your ideal client or is it just your preferred style of communication? If it's going to get your ideal client, then great. If it's just the way you like to communicate, then you probably need to change some of the language. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned the done for you service, Sarah, and I know this is something that you and your firm do. So can you tell us a little bit about how that actually works when it comes to setting up a done for you service or outsourcing some of these productivity functions and operations, you know, what can someone expect when they work with a service provider Mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think many times entrepreneurs, they start their business and they're in this stage where they're not ready to bring on a full-time VA or even a part-time VA, or they just can't stomach being responsible for making sure somebody gets paid on a regular basis. And that's really why I like the done for you service, because what we can do is you have a problem, like we have too many people on our initial calls and we're spending so much time doing this and they're going, they're not going to actually produce customers. And you could hire us to say, we're, we want you to take all our initial calls and we can do that for a limited time for a longer time and really just take that part of your business over that maybe either you don't like, or you're overwhelmed with, but it's not a long-term commitment, like hiring somebody, and then you're not sure if you're going to be able to have them long-term or you just don't have enough for them to do. You know, I've, I've worked with business owners. They're like, I don't have 40 hours worth of work for somebody. So it's a great way to get one specific piece of your business basically done for you so that you can focus on what you're good at. And does that involve, you know, how do they get to know the business owner, their, their voice, their preferences, their, you know, style so that they're able to represent the business well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. We spend a lot of time getting to know the business owner. We actually will go through their process. I usually have somebody that I put undercover so they don't really know. Oh, secret shopper. Secret shopper. Yeah. And it's a great way to get to know the business owner in their, in their natural habitat, if you will, because they don't know, like if I do it, they know they're telling me what ends up happening is they tell me how they sell rather than show me how they sell. And we really want to see how they sell naturally. And then that's where we can identify, you know, some areas of opportunity and then what their real strength is, because the end goal is we're not going to work with the the client. They need to to jive with you. And so it's really about figuring out how, how to sell that in the way that the business owner would be now knowing that there's always different things, but I like to team people up who are, are very similar to the business owner. So it's not a disjointed handoff. Love that. There's so much intention there, which I think is really cool. I think it's brilliant that you guys do secret shopper because I do think that people paint a better picture because they don't want you to judge 
um, they say, oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. We have a good process. We have this, we have that. And then when push comes to shove, it's like, yeah, but I didn't do it this time. It might be inconsistent. So yeah. I love that you, that you guys actually dig into that. Yeah. You, you learn so much, but you also find so much gold because mm. many times entrepreneurs are very hard on themselves because they'll say, well, you know, I had 15 calls, but I didn't get any sales. Well, yeah, you had 15 calls with people who weren't your ideal client, but you did great here. You did awesome here. And this was a really gold statement, but they're just worried. They're just, you know, beating themselves up because they didn't get them to move forward. Yeah. Saying the right thing to the wrong person. Yep, exactly. Right. I love that. And I think that it's an underappreciated area where mm -hmm. I know that we're trying to, it's, that we think it's a numbers game of pure, you know, getting people in the door and, you know, conversion rates and other things. We need to do a better job as entrepreneurs of looking at who are we bringing in the door yeah. and are they really the right fit for what we're trying to sell? And are we messaging properly? You said it best that it all starts with that. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we can work on the efficiencies of how to evaluate them. I think that was fun. Yeah. 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 So, and it all starts with what you're putting out and that's how you'll end up getting the right people, but it is overwhelming. There are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for networking and you meet people. And I think sometimes it can get overwhelming when you're doing all these calls. And especially if you're, if you're a service provider and, and you're jam, or you don't really want to be doing sales, it, it, it is kind of a numbers game, but you have to have a tough skin because not everyone is going to say yes. And if you don't love that kind of mindset of, okay, on to the next one, mm. it takes a long time to recover. Yeah. And one thing that I know I struggled with early on, and I know most folks do, I think if you don't struggle with this, I'd like to know what you're, what's in the water you're drinking, but <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what bothered me was I would get, I would feel a sense of rejection every no, even though they weren't mm -hmm. the right fit. And I would love to get a yes and get on an emotional high when someone was interested in working with me early on that I was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to work with this person, this, 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 all the good things that I turned a blind eye to blatant red flags. And, yeah. and then I love the idea. I wish this was, was possible early on in my business to have another set of eyes, a, a local skeptic, if you will, on my shoulder, yeah. like the conscience that's like, yeah. Did you hear what they said about their bookkeeping though? <laughs> Yeah. Do you hear that it was going to be a complete disaster? Cause I think you should charge like $5,000 for a QuickBooks cleanup before you even entertain this idea. And I yeah. wish somebody was in my ear saying that and was a second set of ear, uh, ears yeah. really listening to those sales calls. Do you also do that with entrepreneurs? Like, you know, look at their recordings and, and offer feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have done that when we bring on a client. And I think that's really important if they have them. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes it's difficult to record a, a sales call um, because sometimes it's it feels a little weird. But if mm -hmm. they do have those recordings or especially if they've done like selling like on a webinar or anything like that, they tend to sell kind of the same way. And I think what, back to your point about having someone in your ear, I think what's really important to me and something that I try and ensure that my entire team understands is that while someone may not be the right fit today, we want them to have a good experience and we want them to love the entrepreneur and still follow them, still attend their podcast. And maybe later it will be the right time or it mm. will be the right fit. So it, that, that no has to be done in a way that is positive, supportive and encouraging. And I think back to your, what, where you were talking about the red flags, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes that's why entrepreneurs end up working with them because they don't want to hurt that person's feelings and say, Oh, your books are a complete hot mess. Yeah. And, you know, so they're like, well, I'll fix it because that'll make them feel good. It'll make me feel good. When in reality, th the conversation should be about, you know, here's some work to do. And here's how I suggest you go about doing it. If you don't have the, the resources, referring them to other people, but then they still have that positive taste in yeah. their mouth about the company. It's usually not a no, it's a not yet. Yep, exactly. I love that. 
So, I think that's so important. Yeah. And, and so how can folks learn more about your done for you services and what you guys offer? Yeah, great question. So of course, my website, sarahmayer.com, which is S-A-R-A-M-A-Y-E-R.com. And then you can always find me on social media at Sarah Mayer Consulting. And we would love to see what you're doing in your business and see if there is a service that we can support you in, either in your intake, in your sales process, or any other operational area. And guys, seriously, a second set of eyes and ears is invaluable to your business, especially an impartial party who is not emotionally invested the way that you are, but cares deeply about your success. And that's a great combination. And that's what Sarah and her team do provide. So definitely check them out. Make sure you're following her on Instagram. And um, Sarah, we love to wrap up our interviews with a couple of rapid fire questions because we love talking about money on this show, as you can imagine. And yeah. I always love learning more about my guests because of the answers to these questions. So diving in, what is one investment that you can't live without? Mm. One investment, business or personal? Anything. And, it, and I'll just, I'll go right ahead and say, let's exclude those amazing headphones that you have. <laughs> oh, yes. My amazing headphones. Actually, I didn't invest in these. These were a gift, but yes. Gaming headphones are a game changer if you do any recording. Love it. I think I think one investment that I couldn't live without was my first uh, assistant. I was mm. really nervous about hiring her and investing in her has been one of the best decisions I've ever made. Amazing. I couldn't agree more. So if yeah. you're listening, Courtney, <laughs> yeah. you're one of mine too. Uh, what did you learn about money that turned out not to be true? Mm. I think this is really interesting because I had, my dad told me long ago that you can either figure out money or you can hire somebody to figure out for you. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't necessarily true because I think you can do both. Yeah. And it's kind of a catch because if you could afford to hire someone to figure it out for you, it means you must've figured something out. So yes, it's this weird correct. circle moment. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. I do like that. Uh, and what makes you feel like a millionaire? That's a great question. For me, it's really seeing other entrepreneurs shine. I think that is the coolest part. And it just makes me feel rich and like I've done a good job helping people. Amazing. And I couldn't agree yeah. more. Seeing others' success is why we do what we do. Yeah. I yeah. Love it. Well, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. I know I actually learned a ton and am now completely inspired to go back into my business and do my little productivity audit, as I hope yeah. all of you listening do. So make sure you're following along with Sarah. Tag us both on social media if you had a takeaway from today's episode, something that you learned that you want to share, because sharing is caring. <laughs> and let's spread the wealth of knowledge on social media from everything that you're hearing on this podcast. So Thank you so much, Sarah, for being on the show. We've loved having you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always great when I get to talk with you. Oh, thank you so much. All right, we'll see you all next week.